Our next guest spent three years on the New York Yankees broadcast team before joining the Yankees. He actually spent 14 years at ESPN where he anchored Sports Center, did play-by-play for the Major League Baseball on ESPN Radio, and he is now the play-by-play announcer for the Dodgers, calling all the games heard here on AM1220 KHTS, the four-time Emmy Award winner. How many Emmys do you have, Jesse? Ugh, I'm still... I haven't got my Cable Ace Award yet. <laughs> and uh, he is a so four-time Emmy Award winner, most recently inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame. Charlie Steiner joins us. Charlie. You talk about me? Yeah, that's all you, man. Wow. Yeah, so uh, thank you for joining the program. We do appreciate it. Well, for you, it's the, what, the last half hour of the program. <laughs> for me, it's the first half hour of my day. You said you had the day off today. Is that true? Uh, that, that, well, I do from now until about... The first of March. Oh. Yeah, Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong. You do have a Cable Ace Award, correct? Yes, I do. Oh, my they, God. They, you know, they don't even make them anymore. I know. That was, uh, you know, I have a small-time reality TV show, and I was really hoping to get one or at least be nominated for one for, I don't know, facial hair or something like that. <laughs> uh, best facial hair on reality TV, but no, gone. It's gone. Well, when, when I had my facial hair, yeah, there were two of us on television that had it, me and Wolf Blitzer. Yeah, I, I, and Wolf still has it. I've shaved mine, and of course I left television. But Wolf and I remain friends because of that that unbroken bond. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I recognize your voice, and I hear you when you do the Dodgers play by play. I, I saw a recent picture, and I'm like, who is this guy? And then I, look, I saw your old school sports. Oh, that oh. guy. Yeah, he's the guy with the beard. He's the sports center guy with the beard. I'm like, oh, okay, now it all makes sense. But of but, course, when I do, you know, games on radio, people think perhaps. He's in a tuxedo, but I am like in an ACDC sleeveless T-shirt. With <laughs> that might be a bit of a break. Uh, uh, All right, so recently you uh, you were inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame. How do you feel about that? It was uh, it was overwhelming. Uh, it was this past Saturday in Chicago uh, when I first got the call at the end of June. <clears throat> would I be available? on November the 9th, and they said, I think I have plans, I'm going to a movie or something, and they said, well, you may want to change your plans. Um, it, I knew there was a Radio Hall of Fame, I had no idea how, how big a deal it really was. I'm half expecting like a broom closet with a couple of black and white photos with faded scotch tape keeping them up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a four-story building, the Museum of Broadcasting. In Chicago, on State Street, and two of the floor, two of the four floors are devoted to radio. I mean, to people like Paul Harvey and Edward R. Murrow and Jack Benny and Groucho Marx, and there is a, a section of sportscasters. I became the seventeenth. Um, so you walk in, and, and and it's a kind of an outer body experience. And then I remember the old. Marv Throneberry commercial for Miller Beer, and they said, I still don't know why they asked me to do this commercial. I was like, what am I doing here? I should be paying admission to get in. Um, and it was a wonderful night. There were about four or 500 people in there, all actually dressed to the nines. And uh, it was like, okay, this happens to other people. You know, I should be sitting at one of those fancy tables. Instead, I'm talking to the folks at the fancy tables. And it was one of those where, okay, if I pinched myself any harder, I would have drawn blood. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking at the uh, the broadcasters, the sports broadcasters that have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and you have, of course, Vin Scully, Red Barber, Mel Allen, Marty Brenneman, Jack Buck, Harry Carey, Erwin, Ernie Harwell, and we got Harry Callis and Bob Euchre, and you know, and Kirk, Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan as well. Yes, and Ronald Who? Reagan as well. <laughs> And and now Charlie Steiner, that's good company to be in. It's it's it, you know again, if I pinched myself any harder, I would have drawn blood. But I think and and um, again, can't be more honored and, and humbled and all of that. Um, you know, I've been in doing baseball for about twenty years, uh, but I also did you know football with the Jets and. Uh, Let's not forget about the uh, the, the generals. generals with uh, in the USFL. I've worked for Donald Trump, George Steinberg, and the uh, McCourts. Wow! I defy anybody to compare their resumes. <laughs> uh, you can get a job uh, anywhere. Yeah, and, and along the way, I managed uh, four uh, news radio stations. Uh, so I've done, I've done a lot of different stuff. So I don't think it, it, it for whatever reason I'm in, but I, I like to think it's more than 
just uh, just the baseball. But, but again, not it's not too bad having done uh, ESPN and the Yankees and the Dodgers, and the Dodgers were inevitably the finish line I wanted to cross. Yeah, that and this is big time. Is this something you always wanted to do though? Like growing up, where well, I, I grew up in New York, right? I was seven years old, and that, that was that was the whole point of the speech the other night. Was that had it not been for the Dodgers, I would not be here. Not because of the last nine years, but be, really because of the first nine years where I grew up a Brooklyn Dodger fan. When yeah. I was seven, I used to listen to the radio, and there was a young baseball announcer named Vin Scully, and, and I. I'm seven years old. Again, this is a whole different generation. There's no cable. There are about five black and white TV stations in, in New York where I grew up. Um, and it was basically all radio. And I was that kid who was just drawn to this speaker. And I would sit there and listen and listen. And, and I was, they had me at hello. And, uh, that's all I ever wanted to be. And I just had to figure out somehow, uh, how to get there. You know, it, it took a half a century and uh, uh, two coasts and uh, 3,000 miles, but uh, I'm exactly where I want to be. And uh, so you grew up a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. Yeah. Uh, what was that like, you know, crossing over to the evil empire that is the New York Yankees? Well, I, I had added a few years to my life by that time. <laughs> well, yeah, um, no, yeah. But I had I had 14 wonderful years at ESPN. I had done uh, the ESPN Sunday Night Baseball package. Um, and at the end of 2001, I had two wonderful offers, uh, one to go to the Yankees um, and one to go to the San Francisco Giants. Truth be told, I would have taken the Giants job, but my folks, who were then rather elderly, uh, my father was in ill health, and I thought, well, gee, you know, I could, hey, that's not a bad plan B, the Yankees. Uh, and he could listen to me uh, at the tail end of his life, which he did, and it, and it worked out. Uh, it worked out great. And my, I, I knew it was kind of special when I rolled into the old Yankee Stadium, uh, and my parking space was number sixty-one. I thought, well, okay, this can work. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. So, did you? Uh, okay, so the, when you saw the Dodgers job open up, was that just something you had to get? What, what was that problem? I got like? a call. I got a call out of the blue. Uh, they had said that uh, they were going to make a, a move on Ross Porter, whom I'd known for years. Um, but you know, this is this is the nature of the business. Um, and would I have interest in coming to the Dodgers? And it was like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, what was fascinating, if folks remember that far back, it's going on ten years now. Uh, there are a lot of names being mentioned as to who would ultimately replace Ross. Uh, mine was really not mentioned at all because I don't think anybody saw it coming, but we had been talking for several weeks. And finally when the uh, deal was made, and it was, it was being reported in New York, am I coming back to the Yankees? And if so, in what capacity? Are there are other teams that are interested. Nobody had anything about the Dodgers. And... So now my mom is, at that point, 92 years old. My father had died six months earlier, and this is the house in which I grew up, in the kitchen that I used to listen on this big radio to Dodger games. I'm trying to figure out now how I'm going to tell my mom (laughs) I'm moving to Los Angeles. That has been in the papers, and she's getting rather confused. Um, So I go out there on whatever day it was. It's right around this time. It's just before Thanksgiving. Um... How am I going to break this to her? All right, Mom, here's the deal. Um, you remember the team I grew up rooting for? She said, oh, yes, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay, says one. Uh, you remember the first ballpark Pop took me to to see a game? Oh, Ebbets Field. You remember the guy I used to listen to all the time? And I wanted to be like, and she couldn't remember his name. I said, Vince Scully. And she said, without missing a beat, oh, good, when do we move to Los Angeles? Wow. Well, all right. <laughs> the wagon train was uh, then uh, packed. Um, and as I'm telling her this, and this is what makes, for me, it is such a wonderful moment in my career in life, as I'm telling her and trying to you know, soften the, the, the blow of moving, phone rings, cell phone. Uh, it's a three-two-three exchange. Okay, Charlie, it's Vin. I just want oh, to welcome you to the Dodger family. 
I said, Mom, I gotta take this one. <laughs> and, and so it was just one of those moments where it was like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Nerding and, out. And then fast forward now 10 years to last Saturday, I'm doing this speech, and who in, is part of the audience, and for that I will forever be indebted, but Mark Walter and his wife Kimber. I mean, so the owner of the team, uh, that I wanted to announce for is wow. in the building as I am being inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame all because of the Dodgers. So it was, so last Saturday was, was pretty damn special. That's, that's, that's awesome. fantastic. That's a really, congratulations on that. That's a Thanks. awesome stuff. So, so we've heard about Charlie the sportscaster, the professional, but I want to hear as the a rank fan. amateur now. <laughs> <laughs> but as, I want to hear as a pure fan because it's something that you don't, you don't hear or you see on television over the radio about how you truly feel. Cause I feel like, you know, obviously you have your history with the Bro- with Brooklyn and everything, but I feel like, you know, the run that the Dodgers made, you secretly had to be like, come on. Come on, we you can know, do it. You know what so it close. is, and, and, and I've taken that that joy with me wherever I go into whatever booth uh, I work. Um, I remember being that seven and eight year old kid who's wide eyed and enthusiastic and not the least bit though. What's the right word? Not jaundiced. You know, I just went out and, and enjoyed watching guys play baseball when I was a kid. Mm. They were big old guys. Now they're they're big young guys, but it's the same joy uh, that I had as a kid, and, and and so whatever you hear on the radio, good, bad, or indifferent, that's how I feel going to work every day. I'm, I'm basically that seven year old kid saying, "All right, for the next three four hours, let's have some fun." And uh, and fellas, try not to screw it up too bad. <laughs> so you have those moments where you're like, I love this guy, but there has to be those other times where you're you're doing a game and you're secretly thinking, this guy is the worst. I, uh, can we trade him, please? You right. know, I feel like in tones you like talk about certain people in general where you you're like he can't be liking this guy right now. You know, his poor play or just time after time mistakes. Where you're just like, you know what? I, I I I feel like, and, and I think. I, and I'm comfortable. I was having lunch somebody who was somebody the other day. I said, "Look, I'm not comfortable being on a soapbox because when you're in a soapbox, you, people are going to take shots at you." So I, I have never considered myself bigger than the game. The game is the thing. Uh, if a guy is doing well, terrific. If he's not doing well, it's also my responsibility to say why I think he is not doing well. Um, and if and if you can keep that balance, if you can keep the seesaw flat, you're going to be all right in the long run. So, again, my career is such, and I, I like to think my credibility is such that when I say something, it is reasonably thought out. Yeah. Uh, but again, when a, a Dodger broadcast, most of the people who are listening are Dodger fans, so it's in their best interest that they do well. It's in my best interest and Rick Monday's best interest that they do well because it's infinitely more entertaining. And if they're not doing well, it's also our responsibility to explain why. And so, you know, that's the soup that we dish out every, uh, well, every one of the 162 games in the regular season, hopefully many more in the postseason. Yeah, and yeah. I hope the same way. As a Dodger, we're speaking with Charlie Steiner, by the way, National Radio Hall of Famer and Dodgers Radio Play-By-Play Man and uh, it, as a Dodger fan, what I, you know, they got to the NLCS, uh, great season. Expectations, of course, were very high coming into the season, and there was you know a very up and down, very hot and cold season. Is there a, maybe one or two things you think that's that's going to be the difference for them to ultimately get to the World Series and you know bring the Commissioner's Trophy back to, it, it, to Los it, Angeles? It's awfully early to answer that. You know, it is what the fifteenth of November is still four months before spring training opens. Uh, there are too many questions at this point that will be answered eventually. Haven't been as yet. You have four outfielders for three spots. Uh, is Ramirez going to play short or third? Are they going to bring in a shortstop? Is Uribe back? Um, you've got basically three pitchers who are locked in and two or three in the bullpen. So there are a lot of uh, vacancies to fill. How they go about it, whether it's through free agency or whether they make some trades, uh, you know, the nucleus is solid, 
but it's aging. But they knew that going in. It was important for the Guggenheim Group to restore credibility and relevance to the franchise in the marketplace, which they clearly did. Uh, but now, that was just the initial step. Now it's a matter of rebuilding the farm system, um, making the major league club a little more youthful and a lot more athletic. Uh, I think th- th- that's the master plan. Now, who is going to fit into those spots to make that happen? We'll, we'll all watch together between now and uh, the beginning of spring training. And here we'll listen. We'll listen together. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. This is radio, so we'll listen. Uh, <laughs> you can't watch. <laughs> so I, I have to ask you this. Um, what does Charlie Stenner do when he's not calling Dodger games? Uh, nothing. <laughs> it's just, it's I, just yeah, the older I get, the more accomplished and more enjoyable it has become to do nothing. Uh, I, I got up early this morning. Speak with you, fellas. Oh, thank is, thank is this some country or what? Yes. Uh, I'm drinking my morning coffee. Um, I'm having lunch with a buddy this afternoon somewhere up in the valley, and you know, for me, that's like going into Bolivia. But I will we'll do that, and then uh, we have a, a little function at Dodger Stadium tonight. I go to the movies um, during the season. I, I'm a big movie fan, but during the season, I have zero time because. We work. Yeah. Uh, during the off season, we don't, and so consequently, I'll spend a lot of time at the movie theater, going to concerts, that kind of stuff. Kyle, I secretly like to think that Charlie and Nick Nixon get together in some L.A. secret radio club. Uh, yeah, probably. Out. That's probably true. So. Yeah. Oh, jeez, keep dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have to ask you this. This is my final question, uh, Charlie. I have to ask you this because my dad will be upset with me if I don't ask you this. Uh, will you lead us to freedom? Follow me. <laughs> <laughs> Follow me to freedom. <laughs> what, 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 what was crazy about that? We did that spot prior to uh, the millennium. Yes, yes. So 1999. That's 14 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and people still know the the, the phrase, and uh, it blows me away. The, and when we were doing a commercial that day, uh, we did four. Tagline said. All those commercials that you saw all over the years, I assume it's probably still done the same way, were shot totally out of sequence, scene by scene by scene. Mark McGuire was somewhere in that. He wasn't even yeah. there that day. And so, so they piece it together like a tapestry. And so mine was obviously the, the last scene. Um, we shot that by segment around three in the afternoon. About noontime, they put the Indian war paint on my face. Okay, fine. So I'm writing the show to, you know, we're going on the air, I guess it's about 7 o'clock Eastern time in those days. Um, and so I'm writing a show. And then they say 3 o'clock, okay, got to go upstairs, and now we're going to shoot. So I go into the men's room, you know, just walk, I was about to wash my face. I look up. For the last three hours, I had Indian war paint on my face, and nobody looked at me twice. <laughs> Just, just uh, another day. Par for the course. Yeah, and, and then at the end, we did about three or four or five different expressions. I'll lead you to the underground, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Come with me. <laughs> Excuse me. And so at the end, it was the, the producer and the editor of the spot that uh, came up with Follow Me to Freedom, which was the one that lasted. Then finally, uh, so this is for your dad. Uh, at, at, at the following spring. You know, the Follow Me to Freedom had run its course pretty well. You may remember Nike had a similar spot with uh, Maddox and Glavin. Chicks dig the long ball. Yes, I do. I do. Remember. It was the exact same format of that as ours, Follow Me to Freedom, done by the exact same advertising agency. And they were given three or four or five different lines to uh, uh, to punctuate the commercial. And Chicks Dig the Long Ball was the one that survives as Follow Me to Freedom did. (laughs) So now it's March, and I'm in Orlando, and I'm still at ESPN, of course. And we are having this loud, fun, funny argument. Which line would live longer? Follow Me to Freedom or Chicks Dig the Long Ball? 
And I'm pretty confident in my position 14 years later. Yeah, I feel, especially the way the pitching is in the Major League Baseball right now. Yeah. yeah so, Follow me. To yeah, excellent. Charlie Steiner, really appreciate you, Thank you, you very much. stopping by. Congratulations on the Radio Hall of Fame. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, hearing you guys in April. And I look forward to talking to you then, if not before. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Charlie Steiner.